Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Um, hey, Marina. Hello, Richard. How are you? I- I'm really well. We've got some fun things to talk about. The first thing we're going to talk about today I'm excited about because it's Brooklyn Beckham, who I'm obviously aware of. He's in my sights. What can't he do, Richard? What can't he do? He's got something new on the horizons, which we will get fully into. We shall find out. We're also going to talk about um, women in Hollywood. They make all the good films now, and yet Hollywood still uh, won't make films with them at the helm. They've completely dominated music as well over the last 12 months, so we'll talk about that. And still in the area of music, A Pitchfork, which was a hugely influential uh, music publication, music criticism publication, has essentially been shuttered as we know it, and it's being folded into GQ by its new owners, Condé Nast, and I will try and explain why I think you should really care about this. We're going to talk about magazines folding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should we start with Brooklyn Beckham? What? That's a, that's a lovely not. way to start. Yeah, let, okay. Former model, former footballer, former photographer, former monograph author, and now chef. What can't you do? What can't you do? Now, Brooklyn has teamed up for a collaboration with Uber Eats. Um, he's, he's had quite a lot of trolling online for the, and people saying this is ridiculous for his cooking, his cooking skills. Anyhow, but according to Uber Eats, I'm going to actually read you this from the press release. Uber Eats host Brooklyn Beckham is reimagining the food delivery status quo. Now, let me tell you how no he's way. doing that. Status yeah. quo are involved as well? Yes, yeah, st- <laughs> the quo are involved. Now, okay, now I'm interested. Yeah, they've got you now. The Uber Eats' general manager says the company's very excited to be working with one of the world's most talked about foodies, yeah. which in some ways doesn't actually commit to a position on either side of it. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, let me tell you what he's doing. He's doing a pop-up restaurant where five dishes created by Brooklyn will be on, available for precisely two days this week, between the hours of 5 p.m. and 10 p.m., to London customers only, and actually on the first of those days, only if you're like an Uber Eats pre- premier customer. So I don't think we're talking about the launch of the Hard Rock Cafe here in terms of like a sort of international concern. However, would you like to know the dishes that he's doing, Brooklyn? That Brooklyn's doing? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Chicken tikka masala, 15 quid. Okay, Nanny Peggy's English breakfast sandwich, 12. Nanny Peggy's... English breakfast sandwich. It's an English breakfast in a sandwich. It's, okay. You know, is it a serving suggestion or is it a recipe? That will be one for, one for those who order it to debate. Deep fried buttermilk cauliflower, 10 pounds. Prawn and pork dumplings, tenner for five dumplings, mm. and spag ball at 15. Wow. Will he be cooking them personally? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing yes. You're guessing wrong, Richard. He will be represented by actual chefs. But what I love is that Uber Eats told the Evening Standard that, don't worry, Brooklyn will be compensated for his time and involvement oh, in the campaign. Phew. Oh, my God, that's and what it... I was going to ask. I was going to say, please, God, tell me he's getting a lot of money for it. So, yeah, he's talked a little bit about doing this particular campaign. He, he's he's trying to move into the food space with some form of uh, venture or another. He's copyrighted a number of things. I think hot sauce labels, sweatshirts, NFTs, I mean, you know, wow. everything you'd expect. But he has taken quite a lot of heat, as it were, for this latest one of his careers. He's only 24, I should say. I think it would probably be better if someone said to him, look, it's fine to have hobbies. <laughs> it's absolutely fine to have them. Then again, he is making a huge amount of money from each of the hobbies that have become a... But here's the interesting thing. That Uber Eats thing, firstly, we're talking about it. Secondly, lots of people are talking about it. Yeah. Thirdly, it will sell out. Now, why is that? Well, as one of London's most committed ironists, I don't, if you don't think I've got a calendar alert in my phone <laughs> for 5pm on Thursday, then you don't know me very well because I will be one of the people buying it just to see. So, yes, the reason I guess we're talking about this is because it's a sort of way into Nepo babies, which you'll probably a phrase you see quite a lot these days. I sort of feel... <sighs> Nepo babies, I think we have made progress on Nepo babies. Bear in mind that in the sort of late Middle Ages, Nepo babies were being given things like bishoprics. Yes. There was a whole point in the history of the British Empire where people would say, you know, what are we going to do with Johnny? You know, his brother's going in the House of Lords, obviously, because he's the elder. I don't know what to do with him. He's a semi-adequate middle order batsman and he likes to drink. How about he runs 50,000 square miles of India? That's what we used to do with Nepo babies. They used to now, have an ambassadorship, not a brand ambassadorship. I think so, yeah. But you used to send them on the grand tours to yes. you, uh, in, in the old days. I mean, they're all family. They're all Nepo babies. The original Nepo babies. And we're comfortable with them. Yes. On that David Beckham documentary, which we've spoken about, he comes across rather well, Brooklyn Beckham. And we when I, when I, when I hear him talk, he seems a very, very sweet guy. And... 
what else is he going to do? I mean, the, the whole point is, if, as you say, if your father was a was landed gentry and owned Hampshire, then that's what you would do. Now, Brooklyn Beckham happens to be in a position where his father was one of the greatest footballers of all time, and his mum was in one of the biggest selling music acts of all time, and then became an enormously successful fashion designer. Neither of which you can't really follow in the family footsteps. He can't go, my dad used to play for England, so I'm going to play for England. But he's got to do something. You know, he had, and if people are willing to throw money his way, you know, at least... And they he, are. The, the, he had an online show called Cooking with Brooklyn where each episode cost something like $100,000 per episode. It was like, And it just looked like it was thrown together. Apparently 62 people were involved in each episode, you know. Having said all that, Richard, I do think that people... Obviously, it's the level at, what you go, at which you go into these things that people can't really stand. It, I mean, as I say, it's fine to have a hobby. You don't necessarily have to make a business out of it. And he had a photography book, which I is... I was going to ask you about it's, that. It's, so it's that iconic. That was, yeah, OK. For ironists, it is iconic. He had a photography book, a monograph called Brooklyn Beckham, What I See. The most notorious caption is a sort of... There's a picture of some background and then a big black thing right in the sort of centre of the frame, which you can't see. And the, the caption is, Elephants in Kenya, so hard to photograph, but incredible to see. I kind there's, of admire I admire the hustle. <laughs> there's another one, which is a really out of focus photo of Victoria Beckham's birthday in a restaurant. And the caption was, I like this picture. It's out of focus, but you can tell there's a lot going on. <laughs> you see, genuinely, everything he's doing is what anyone else his age would be doing. It's absolutely not his fault in any way whatsoever. No, ever. He's, this he's... book was launched at Christie's. It's not really his fault, but I think it probably is our culture's fault. Well, there's something about the culture about... In fact, we might get onto it when we talk about magazines, about how there is no grand culture anymore. Everything is siloed. Yes. And so, you know, if you can get 100,000 people to really, really, really like something, then you're profitable. And, you know, you can certainly do that. And so these big organisations, of course, they jump on board. Uh, and I sort of think... There's something not quite right. Listen, we, we were on a plane recently and there's an amazing um, group of women, all of whom were makeup influencers, and they were flying out to New York and being flown out there um, by some big company. And I thought, this is so great because they were smart, they were funny, they were obviously making their own money in a, in a, in a, in a really good way. They are providing a service that, that, that people were enjoying. Um, one of them was putting on her mascara during turbulence on camera. Respect so the I work. Think absolutely fair play. So that world of influences, I get people, when someone's got a skill and do, is doing something and connects with people, I think it's a perfectly valid way to make a living. The Nepo baby thing is slightly harder, isn't it? Because yeah. it's questionable as to whether he would be where he was without his parents. But I, that's I, not I his I believe fault. that it's, it's answerable, <laughs> actually. I don't think it's questionable. I, I think... My question is, would he be? Your answer is... <laughs> No, I just don't think he quite have made it. But again, and it's an older brother thing. The t the the younger kids seem very chill. Brooklyn's the, the oldest, and his parents are such high achievers. Um, he's got to got to do something, hasn't he? He's got to find his way in the world and, and find a way of being himself. Uh, it's just yeah, it leaves an uncomfortable taste. The fact that there's money he's making. That, well, it's that so maybe, often in industries yeah. that other people really struggle to get ahead on. Yeah, uh, in, and it's it, in they're in it's in difficult industries, and that's what really sort of gets to people. Well, like, acting is the crazy one. I mean, well, acting yeah. is all, it's all Nepo, but it, but it always has been. Yes. All of these people are Nepo babies, all of whom we would consider legends. So forget all the kids now who get slagged off. George Clooney, Nepo baby, Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, Ben mm. Stiller, Gwyneth Paltrow, Angelina Jolie, Charlie Sheen, Laura Dern, Michael Douglas yeah. is an 80-year-old Nepo baby. <laughs> but Hollywood is a town that's entertainment and you work in the family industry. Britain's greatest Nepo babies. Matty Healy, lead singer of the 1975. Yes. Uh, and um, did he go out with Taylor Swift? Twice out with her, once very briefly and once fleetingly briefly. Oh, there's a career in that. Um, so he is the son of Tim Healy. He used to play Dennis yeah. in Alfreda Zane yeah. Pet and Denise Welsh from Loose Women. Yeah. But that's that's not Nepo Baby because they're not they are not able to get you into the into the rock world. No. I think what he's done there is written some songs that people liked and sung them and then sold records. Also, um, Barney Walsh, who hosts, as we know, Gladiators with Bradley Walsh. Yes, I, mean, I felt he was worse this week than he was in the first week. He almost like a radioactive isotope. He's, he's getting worse at a, a quite an extreme sort of half-life of quality presenting. I like him. I like the two of them together. But, do you know, the greatest Nepo babies in Britain, I tell you, Paul and Sophie from Gogglebox, who are the niece and nephew of the Chuckle Brothers. Really? Yeah. That's, hey, that's how they got where they are today. Yeah. That's okay, good that's, though, isn't it? That, that is fantastic. I did not know that fact. That's our version of, uh, of Kirk Douglas and Michael Douglas. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's just so much better. Okay, obviously I will be sampling Brooklyn's yeah. food and uh, as cooked by representatives of him, and I will get back to you on how it tasted next week. I cannot wait. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We want to talk now about... There's an interesting trend in the last few years that women tend to be dominating pretty much every cultural field, music, books, um, movies, and yet they don't seem to be dominating the uh, the economic realities behind those industries. Does it, does that sound too blurry a focus? It, does, well, it doesn't. It, women, like, it, I, was, I was reading, because you were telling me about this particular phenomenon, that women had dominated the UK's mu music scene in 2023, and they accounted for the most weeks of number one since the inception of the charts in 1952. And... It's it's quite clear that you're kind of living living in an era of like female artist domination, and the biggest biggest people. And obviously, you're looking at things like Taylor Swift and Beyonce's tours, which are, they've become these kind of phenomenal brands. Ariana Grande, yeah. Olivia Rodrigo. Yes, exactly. And the book charts tell me about that because I, this is your specialism and not mine. Well, yeah, the book charts. I mean, see, that's the interesting thing is women tend to consume more stuff, and certainly books books. Fiction books, it's almost 66% to 33% female Is it? dominated readers. Yeah. Gosh. And the biggest books, Bonnie Garmus, Gabriella Zevin, yeah. I mean, Sarah J. Mass, Rebecca Yaros, all of these people selling absolutely bundles of books. And my experience just in, in, in the publishing industry is very, very, very um, female dominated when when we were selling thursday murder club you you go on a sort of beauty pageant of the yeah. of the, the the companies who've, who've offered on the book and i think we met five companies and they all had all their heads of department would come in and, and, and chat to you uh, and there were 40 people we met that day and one of them was a man gosh 39 women but at the end of three different meetings the head 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 of the publishers came in to say hi and all three of them were men now, I'll say this about all three of those men. They're all brilliant. They are. I mean, they're good. Yeah. You know, they're really, really good. But there was also a number of really, really, really good women around that table. And publishing has been quite female heavy for a long time. So it's not like, oh, you know, it, certain industries say, yeah, but we need the supply chain. You know, you know, the women who entered into this sort of industry in the 90s need to be yeah. becoming the CEOs. Books have had that for a long time. Why is this, do we think? Now, in, in, in movies, there's incredible female stars and female directors, but again, it's such a financially a male-dominated industry. Completely. The biggest movies, I guess, of 2023 were, with the exception of Barbie, all directed by men. But that also means that the biggest flops of the year were also directed by men. And so you're looking at things like The Flash, um, Indiana Jones, The Dial of Destiny, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning whatever our fast Transformers iteration we're now on. These all did really quite badly. And it's interesting, there was a really interesting article on Puck the other day, which said, which was kind of taking a look and saying that actually the biggest hits of the last five months have been, without exception, female driven, female skewing. So you've got Mean Girls, which by the way, just this weekend has had its second week at the top of the box office. You've got The Colour Purple, Sorry, that's not, I guess you wouldn't say maybe that's a massive hit so far in the UK, but you would have Taylor Swift and Beyonce's concert films, which were huge. Uh, Hunger Games, Ballad of Song of Birds and Snakes and Wonka, which is definitely female skewing. And actually quite a lot of these have got a, a sort of funny thing that they're doing at the moment, with the movie studios, which is they're musicals but the trailer doesn't tell you it's a musical. <laughs> and so they kind of hide what's called the musicality of the film. But um, So it's interesting. But, you know, Catherine Bigelow won an Oscar for The Hurt Locker. She was the first woman to win a Best Directing Oscar in 2008. The pace of, of change has been very slow, really. I mean, if you look, things like Mamma Mia grossed more than Iron Man. Yeah. And people sort of say, oh, well, yeah, that's a blip. That's a blip. They always explain these kind of female kind of big, big hits as a blip. And then, then they say these things, what we call a four quadrant movie, which is what a film industry term for. It appeals to all four quadrants of the supposed movie going demographic. What all are the, the four quadrants? Males over 25, males yeah. under 25, yeah. women over 25 and women under 25. And so those don't get, feel like quadrants. They don't. It feels it's all, to me just like, for like everyone in the world. Well, there is everyone, but also quadrants should be equal. Men and women over 25, there's loads of them. Yes. There's hardly anyone under 25 anymore, isn't there? Well, what they're trying to do is try, and you get these kind of quite black, you know, this is why superhero franchise, high concept, things like this, fantasy things. Yes, they've tried to appeal to literally everybody. And because they spend such enormous amounts of money on these movies that you kind of need 
everybody to be able to consider themselves as part of the potential audience. Them. And ev- everything has to be a hit in Hollywood now, doesn't it? Because, everything has because to. they launch so few films. And because they spend so much. You know, if you're spending $350 million on a movie, then you've kind of got everyone to go, go and see it. The kind of death, death of the $60 million budget movie means that it has to be absolutely massive. But the pace of change has been very slow, as I said. One of the things that's quite interesting is, I, yeah, what you were talking about earlier is do men want to invest as in proper serious, like almost venture capital type of money into women or men who are not like them? I was talking to someone in the hairdressing world the other day and he said something really interesting. He said, you tell me why in a business that is totally dominated by women and gay men, the only four people to ever have made big, big, serious money out of hairdressing are straight men. Okay, Vidal Sassoon. John Frieda, Nikki Clark, Frederick Fakai. And I was like, and he said, you know what? I just, he said, I think they kind of see you as decorative and they don't, they they like having, you might be fun to have around, but they don't want to give you their big dollars to invest in your company, make a huge kind of international business. And there's a lot to be said about that in Hollywood as well. There is, they, they may, you know, women have always been, essential to the movie making process and they were actually essential to the development of film in the first place but they in terms of getting the big bucks and big investments we continue to kind of invest in these male-led tentpole movies that is a bit of a worry because if you think of those for the last five months of which of these female skewing movies have made all the money what's on the slate coming up in the next year is more of these tentpole movies because it's a little bit like the old super tanker. It's quite hard to turn around. It takes so long to make these things that in the pipeline are all these other kind of Marvel movies, all the sort of similar things are coming down the line that there is really no guarantee that there's going to be a return on it. And I think that it would be great if they suddenly started thinking that they might back women a little bit more and get and maybe just dispense with the idea that every movie has to be a four quadrant movie. All I'm thinking is I'd like to watch a movie about a super tanker. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. <laughs> no, but it's exactly right. I mean Jason Statham stars. No hold on, Jason Statham in Super Tanker. Yeah. I mean that's this is sort of the movie I'm talking about, isn't it? But yeah, I mean That's really good. I'm so looking forward to Super Tanker Four. That's a two quadrant movie. Yeah. Super Tanker Four, one eighty degrees. Uh, but it's exactly right that Women are, by and large, have become the audience, the influencers as to what films do well. Um, and yet, so many Fast and Furious, so you know, Indiana Jones, all these things. Another and, flop and, this year, effective flop. Yeah, and it's and it's there's a sensibility in lots of industries, which is male skewing art is default art. Yeah, uh, and you have to break away from that to make something that appeals to women. Uh, and you th- I think it's probably the other way around. I totally I th- agree. It's not a niche gen- genre. Yeah. It's things, way more than 50% of your audience. <laughs> things women like. Yes. It's not a niche genre. And in fact, throughout the whole of history, things women like tend to be the things that uh, that, that make the most money. It's a, it's, it's a fascinating one. Books I genuinely find interesting. I like the meritocracy of the thing that, 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 that book charts are, are 66% women and that books are read 66% of the time by women. I think that's great. But there's been a lot written in books recently. Three or four years in a row, all the big book prizes, every single person on the shortlist was a woman. There were no male, um, no no men on any of those shortlists. And people started going, what's happened to the male novel? And you think, I think the male novel's okay. I think, I think. Fears I, for the male novel. Yeah, yeah no, I fears, think it'll. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's going to be good. And TV, like the biggest stars, Claudia Winkleman, Addison Hammond, you know, the people, like they, they can make a show watchable for everybody, you know, and it's and it takes such a long time again to turn that around. You know, it's, uh, and it takes such a long time to turn that around. I mean, people were quite hotly defending the fact that there are now of those big Saturday night shows, there was, n- there's no, there are no women hosting any of those ones in that big slot. I can't remember what they all are. Gladiators, Michael McIntyre. It, it's all, it's all men, with the exception of um, Claudia doing traitors when it's on. Exactly, and Strictly. Yeah. Which is Claudia when it's again. on, but it's yeah again, yeah. What's your view of what's going to happen though? Do you think that all of that money, the real money that gets made, which is venture capital money, which is studio money, yeah. which is publisher money, do you think that's going to start getting diverted? 66% to women. To a huge extent, movies has been a, such an odd business um, that you never know what's going to work. You know, nobody knows anything. The famous dictum William Goldman said about Hollywood. And there were certain bankers in the business. Someone, and actually, this is quite an interesting thing. Disney 
Disney has always been female skewing. I'm not including some of the things they've bought under their umbrella, Star Wars, Marvel, but things like Pixar and the Disney catalog of its own sort of hits that they're now sort of remining and making as live action. It's really interesting that none of those hits that I mentioned earlier in um, in this item have cut, have come from Disney. And, you know, Disney have had loads of misses. I remember seeing them at Com Comic Con like a couple of years ago. And the guy said, you know, the, the announcing the things on the slate said, have you ever wondered how the wishing star, the one that so many Disney characters wished upon came to be? Answer, no, please tell me you haven't made a film about it. But they have. <laughs> And you see that they're getting down to sort of dregs. It's like, why don't you just sort of back some people to make something interesting? Yeah. Obviously, Greta Gerwig was, as, a, as, a, as I've said before on the podcast, that I do have a slight problem with the fact that it was all done in the service of Mattel, the big toy corporation. But she did something really, you know, clearly phenomenal and amazing with it. And it, the idea that women can't do these things and that there isn't the audience must surely, just on the numbers alone, be dispensed with. I think so. I think that when you have um, industries by and large tend to be, certainly the movie industry, tend to be run by people who are maybe 20, 30 years into their career. They're the ones with the hits under their belt and, you know, who, with, with a track record. And it's very difficult if you've had 30 years in an industry not to make the sort of movies your gut told you to make in the 1990s. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people in TV whose who's only real understanding is I, I need... I should still be making the TV programs I wanted to make yeah. in the 1990s because the audience is completely gone and it takes a long time for that to turn around. That's not going to turn around till Super Tanker 6 <laughs> with Jason Statham and, uh, and and Vin Diesel. And so I think that... Real name Mark Sinclair. There's so much take home on this podcast. <laughs> so I think that it feels like things have to change because you can't fight reality for too long. And the reality is... Female skewing stuff has been making more money than male skewing stuff for quite a while now. And there comes a point where even Hollywood has to judge money above misogyny. Yeah. Can you imagine? They're two favourite things. They finally but, got put yeah, one of them first. But they like money. I mean, yeah. you know, money I, is their most favourite. I long for a day when it is not Brooklyn Beckham who's doing an Uber Eats collaboration. It's Harper yeah. Beckham. Well, I'm sure you won't have to wait too long. Now, something else that has happened this week is Pitchfork magazine, one of the leading online music magazines. Um, there's been, let's say, a market correction marina. Yeah. Pitchfork was started in uh, 1996 by a former record shop owner, a real classic, you know, a woman? entry into that. No, not a woman in this case. <laughs> but by the 2000s, it had become this. It was all it's all online. It was a hugely important tastemaker. It was like the big it's the biggest fish, basically. And um, they did all their album reviews. They did sort of marks out of 10 um, and they became sort of cultish. And even if you defined yourself against it because you thought you weren't really a pitchfork person, it was this absolutely dominant voice in music criticism. And the music industry has obviously changed massively in that time. You've had Napster, then you've had Apple Music, and then eventually you have Spotify. Now, it was then acquired by Condé Nast in 2015, which is obviously the big American magazine group. And they had, lay they had half the staff were laid off and they are folding it into GQ. Now, Anna Winter, the fearsome US Vogue editor, nicknamed Nuclear Winter, um, and on whom the Meryl Streep character in The Devil Wears Prada was based. She's the global chief content officer of Condé Nast. I have to say, I, this detail is horrifying. She kept her sunglasses on throughout the whole process of telling all these people that they were being fired. Now, she did once say of the sunglasses, you know, they're seriously useful. I can sit in a fashion show and if I'm bored out of my mind, nobody notices. So poor dear, I very much hope she wasn't too bored to be sacking all those people. Anything ad supported, which Pitchfork was, is losing money. Almost all av advertising now online goes to three companies, which are Google, Amazon, and Meta, which obviously owns Facebook. But, but what is happening What is that we're losing huge amounts of the music press. There's Enemy has gone, Q has gone. And, but Pitchfork it was the biggest fish, as I say. Now, if you're thinking of me, why does it matter, okay? Why does it matter, Marina? Why does it matter? I tell you why, because something human is dying and it is being killed by machines and it is being replaced by machines. It's all AI now. Most things are now, even Spotify started with humans curating playlists and things like that. Now it's all done by AI. But why did you ever care about music criticism? You might be thinking, well, in the old days, it was a lot more important because you obviously have a certain amount of disposable income that you might spend on new music. And you needed a guide so that you weren't wasting your money. You want, needed someone to tell you whether it's good, why it was good. You might 
totally disagree with him. You might think I hate this critic. They'll probably love this because he hates it or whatever it is. Um, but they were your human guide to this world. And they also helped us understand the place of music in our current culture, They understood, to understand it as art, anyhow. You, but now when you can listen to anything completely cheaply, what does it matter whether, you know, you, you don't need a music critic. People think you don't need a music critic because you have something, you know, we talk about things like discoverability and mm -hmm. algorithms are machine guides to this world. They are machine guides to the world of art. And what that is meaning is that this world is becoming flattened and less creatively diverse because what they recommend to you all the time is things like the things you already like. It's like that bit on, you know, the little thing on Amazon, customers who like this also liked, but for art. So what that does is that actually decreases diversity, creative diversity, and it makes things sound similar to each other. And I mean, Pitchfork saw all this coming and I read, I was going back over some old great reviews and I remember seeing one, someone describing someone as what an artist is wearing hippie costumes that they 3D printed off the internet. Now, Pitchfork could sort of see the machines coming for them, you know, their brand of kind of human taste making was going to be replaced by algorithmic taste making but we are the poorer for all of this definitely i'm peter robinson who's a music writer who always tweets as pop justice who's music writing i've always really liked he wrote a really interesting thread about it this week and he began by mentioning q magazine folding in the former editor saying to the music business i'd say you're going to miss the music press why because it did the one thing you failed to value through its lens it made your act seem exciting and larger than life even when they weren't that's so true, isn't it? That's all music journalism is trying to take profoundly boring people and uh, and give them anecdotes to tell. So the thing is, people are still reading just as much as they ever were. Advertisers are still advertising. Advertisers still need people to um uh, to to buy their stuff. But as you say, it's just all been funneled into three massive companies. And so what publishers are having to do across magazines and across newspapers is chase a smaller and smaller pot of advertising. And obviously, they have less and less money to spend on content because their money comes from advertising. And so that clickbaity stuff, a lot of which is AI generated, which sort of scrapes other sites and, you know, says you'll never believe what Gordon Ramsay looks like now. And you think, I, I, yeah. listen, I've got a guess, you know, <laughs> but you also going to go, oh, I actually wonder what it does look yeah. like now. That's what journalism is becoming. It's what magazines have had to become as well. Print magazines, that industry is Yes, really, really this is the canary out. in the coal mine, as you say, for other for other industries, for all types of journalism and for all this type of writing. You know, some of the, Sports Illustrated has effectively lost its license, which is a huge sort of legendary publication. It's been going for over 70 years, I think. And it's lost its license to publish in the US this week. They had an um, I, I, AI scandal a couple of months ago where it was discovered that like lots of the content was written by people who didn't really exist. And all of this is coming for all of journalism, and then actually really for the wider culture. The machines are winning. It, it does really matter that, that I, you know, we've, we've got to fight for the human. We know exactly what happens because we've seen it before because it was the Industrial Revolution. So we know yeah. what happens. We, yeah. know, we know that the machines take the jobs. What you hope happens is that, you know, in the case of what's happened with vinyl, that suddenly there is a sort of under industry of really, you know, handcrafted things and, you know, handwritten things and things that are made by real human beings. But again, that's sort of only accessible to certain groups of people. It's not a particularly democratic thing. So again, you get this sort of, you know, art becomes selective and art belongs to a certain group of people because all the big companies are feeding you the same stuff all the time and none of the small companies can compete. Print magazine, take a break magazine, used to sell 1.5 yeah. million copies a week. It now st it still sells half a million, by yeah. the way, uh, which is a lot. Uh, I can only find three magazines in the top 10 whose circulations have gone up in the last 10 years. Oh, that's interesting. What are they? They are The Economist, Private Eye, and Slimming World. R <laughs> well, what a story of our times. Isn't it just? And things, you know, Elle magazine now has a hotel in France, Good Housekeeping, which still sells a lot of copies. You know, they have their own um, furniture range. You know, these brands have to be doing different things. Yeah, but... they have sponsored. They have sponsor content. They have things that are they 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 kind of curate experiences. So in a way, they're falling prey to the same kind of algorithms as exactly uh, that as and the things they write about. Print magazine sales have gone from a billion to three hundred million in ten years. 
I have a theory about why it is, and that's because we always used to read magazines in dentist waiting rooms, and now none of us can find a dentist. <laughs> that's got to have something to do with it. But it, it is, uh, we, we have to protect this sort of thing at all costs, because we, we are going to be served slop for many, many years to come, and our kids but are going to be served slop. Yeah, because it's it's the digital ones that are going too. You yeah. know, BuzzFeed News has gone, Jezebel's gone. Lots of these places where you would find forms of cultural criticism and, and fun and things like that have gone. And there, nothing is really replacing them. And apart from machine creation, the discoverability thing that they have with the algorithms for someone like so to Spotify or whatever, people being suggested similar things to the things they already like does keep them listening. But it doesn't actually drive proper engagement and like long term subscriptions that people want to be want to see new things. So lots of those companies have said we need to get better at that and we need to get better at increasing diversity but what they really mean is we need a machine to get better at that they don't mean a human they don't mean a human guide to this world anymore fascinating that just you know the 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 uh, the sort of closing down or the folding in of one magazine tells you an awful lot about where our culture is heading my first ever job when i was 15 i used to write for the nme uh, and back then I used to write, um, I sort of sent in a couple of live reviews and they published them. And so I, I wrote for them when I was at um, uh, when I was at school. What a thrill. And uh, in those days, NME, Melody Maker and Sounds would all come out yeah. every Wednesday, three competing magazines. All I read all of them. We all yeah. read, you know, you were obsessed with all of them. And actually, but, but to some extent, Pitchfork, people would check the yeah. site six times a day when it was really in its pomp and they would just keep going back in. And I saw a music writer in The Guardian saying she, she, even if she sort of thought, oh, I'm really going to recoil against this, she couldn't stop dialing in. But I will say um, there's an awful lot of magazines still out there which really are written by real people and yes. edited by great editors. And they are having a really, really, really tough time of it's hard to make money in that industry, but they're doing amazing work. So, you know, if you ever sort of think, should I pick up a magazine? Maybe pick one up. I mean, even look online. It's all its all the same. So long as it's real journalists writing in real magazines for real people, then I think it's to be encouraged. Because the niche things matter. The niche things that no one else particularly wants to cover because it's some experimental band review, you know, album or whatever it is. Th those things really matter because those are what give the real light and shade to the culture. As you say, otherwise it becomes very grey and centrist and flattened. That's us done, I think. Is it? Was that too depressing? This week. What about some cheery recommendations, yeah, Richard? Sure. To oh, live oh my God. Do you know what? My recommendation is not cheery at all. Okay. It is brilliant, but yeah. it's not cheery. You do yours. Okay. I saw a few movies this week. I saw The Boy and the Heron, which is the, I'm a bit late on seeing this, which is the um, Studio Ghibli, the last, probably the last one of Hayao Miyazaki. It's so beautiful to look at, of course. I mean, we were all quite confused for quite significant sections <laughs> of the movie. Um, having said that, it is extraordinary to look at, and I recommend it on that basis. I alone. really want to see uh, The Boy, the Heron, and the Super Tanker. Yeah. <laughs> which I believe is the follow-up. Yes, I, yes, it, with a Statham knockoff in it, yeah. yes. But animated Statham. Statham knockoff. Studio Ghibli Statham, Statham, yeah. I can't imagine that, but um, and thankfully I'll never have to. American Fiction is brilliant. This is in, what, another movie, which is, I'm not sure it's quite out. It might be coming out. It'll be out later this month, and I thoroughly recommend that. It's on. It will be on lots of the um, awards best of lists. And I also saw The Holdovers, which is the new Alexander Payne movie with Paul Giamatti. And that is fantastic as well. Yes, my wife saw that. She loved it. Um, I'm going to recommend something on iPlayer. I love iPlayer so much. And there's lots of tiny little hidden corners of iPlayer that are so beautifully curated. We were talking about curating things and making things that other people wouldn't make and, and you know, people finding them. Um, the, the wonderful Muriel Spark, who wrote The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie oh. and lots of other great books. Her book, Memento Mori, BBC Two, in the early 90s, did a, a, a one-off TV version of it. I didn't Stephanie know Stephanie Cole is in it. Maggie Smith is in it. Um, uh, Michael it's Horden. It's a fantastic novel. I it. only read it a couple of years ago, and it is absolutely brilliant. And it's just populated with unbelievable actors. It's so sort of dark but funny. Yeah. Flora Heard is in it, of which course. is the second time she's been mentioned on this podcast. Um, it's so okay. Yeah, beat that. The rest is history. Uh, so Memento Mori, hour and a half, just one of those beautiful things that, you know, kind of the, the BBC do, do set in the 50s in London, loads of old people and so dark but funny and ultimately very, very uplifting as well. But that's it's wonderful just finding amazing stuff that you, you thought had been lost. That's us done, I think. Uh, we will see you next Tuesday for our regular episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.